Cue the Caesar Flickerman theme. Today we are discussing PETA's point of view of Mockingjay called The Mutt. It is a fan fiction on Archive of Our Own by IGSY Grace and it's incredible. This has literally been months in the making. I read the first two and it took me forever to read this one because I wasn't sure that I was ready, prepared <laughs> for the pain that PETA goes through. It might have been my favorite PETA's point of view. So I, oh my gosh, I took so many notes, you guys. Let's put this over here or else I will literally be holding it the entire video. Just so you know, I had, I'm not kidding, literally four pages of printer paper notes. There we go. Oh gosh, I hope we can make it through this. Once again, I do have work in an hour. <laughs> she started off right where we left off in Catching Fire. So in Catching Fighter, whoa, in Catching Fighter, in Catching Fire, PETA witnesses the hovercrafts crashing, the tributes being taken, some being killed. He is taken to the tribute center. It starts off with PETA, with someone hitting him. He feels a little drugged and he's repeating out loud, Katniss was a mutation. Katniss was created by the capital. Katniss started this war. She is bad. She's tricking everyone. I have to warn them. PETA was screaming at the man, don't trust her, she's a mutt. That was kind of showing, you know, what was gonna happen to our our boy PETA. It was very interesting because IGSY Grace, she took a different route when writing Mockingjay, which I really enjoyed, but it could have also been kind of confusing. I think the first chapter, we start off him waking up in District 13 and he's with a doctor. The doctor's kind of explaining what the Capitol did. And so we kind of go back and forth to after he was saved and in District 13 to when he arrived at the training center and starts to become hijacked. And then they kind of meet in the middle and then we proceed the story. So that's a, actually a huge part of the book because if you think of Katniss, Katniss meanwhile is accepting becoming a Mockingjay, dealing with coin, dealing with her emotions, she's training, filming all these propagandas. There's a huge chunk before they discover PETA. I would say PETA's point of view is not quite as long before he's saved because there is more of an epilogue and more story of the war. You know, when they go and raid the capital, it's like boom, boom, boom in Katniss's point of view. And the same thing kind of with PETA's, but there is more dialogue, there's more storyline, which I so enjoyed. I just honestly, I loved seeing Mockingjay and PETA's point of view because we don't know what PETA's doing. And we never really know. Like Katniss understands that he's tortured, that they used Venom to create this idea of her for him, and they took a lot of his memories. How he is interpreting everything as the new version of himself was so interesting to see, and she did an incredible job. It made me so intrigued with the story. The fact that I enjoyed PETA's point of view as much as I enjoyed Katniss's point of view. Mockingjay is incredible. There's a lot of controversy with Mockingjay just because people are, you know, they think, oh, it's kind of boring, like she films propaganda, like the whole feel doesn't feel the same. Katniss is just wants to die, then Prim and Finnick die. Like a lot of people just feel like it should have been a happier ending. I, of course, would choose to keep everyone alive, but I know why Suzanne Collins did it. It's a dystopian world, it's a messed up world. So I've always liked Mockingjay. It's not my favorite, of course, like Catching Fire is my favorite. That's just like the climax of the series for me. But there's a lot to unpack with Mockingjay and I think that's where we can learn the most and reflect on our own societies. Okay, I'm rambling. For the sake of this video, when we discuss these points, instead of going the back and forth like the way it was written, I'm just gonna do it in chronological order so we can all follow along and everything. PETA first arrives to the tribute center. He is showered and he is led to a cell by a peacekeeper. They immediately interrogate him to see if he knows anything. As we know, PETA knows freaking nothing. Of course says, I don't know anything, I don't know anything. He is abused, hit, and then I think they kind of figure out Hmm, 
he might really not know anything. There are some trigger warnings put before chapters of torture. I won't really go into depth, so you should be fine. So he's alone in the cell, and then the next day, Joanna appears in the cell next to him where she is covered in bruises. And for some reason, they show PETA the last part of the games on film. And so they just do like funny things like that just to like show him and be like, okay, do you know anything? Do you know what's happening? PETA's like, I, I don't know. I literally don't know. I wasn't in on anything. And neither was Katniss. As the peacekeepers kind of interrogate him, they start to say things like, Katniss did this to you. Katniss is the reason this is happening. Katniss destroyed Panem. And he comes back to his cell and he's like, that was so interesting. That was really weird. I don't know the purpose or effectiveness of why they would tell me these things. And him and Joanna have like some conversations. Of course, they're so tired, so abused and so broken. They don't have many conversations. He kind of explains what happened because she's like, what happened in there? And he's like, they were telling me that Katniss is a horrible person. And she was like, oh my gosh, they're going to try to brainwash you. He's scared. He doesn't know what, like, are they going to kill him? And Joanna's very straightforward. Joanna says it in her way, like, try to hold on to anything. So Peta's like, okay, orange, green. Those are the two things I will try to hold on to. My favorite color is orange, her favorite color is green. As he's like kind of going insane just from neglect and from pain and from torture, he just repeats that to himself. Any moment where he needs to think of anything, he'll think of orange and green. Then Annie is taken and she is tortured and she you can hear her screams, but we don't really see Annie after that. And as far as we know, when Annie does come back in District 13, she wasn't, Annie was kind of already messed up from the games anyways, but they didn't hijack her. He he starts, the capital starts to show him like videos of things. He's forced to watch them. He is hating it because everything's starting to look a little weird. They kind of have weird haze, kind of a weird film to them. Their memories of Katniss, of the games. He's like, I don't remember Katniss ever doing that. That's really weird and honestly kind of hurtful. Or he starts to have like images of Katniss doing inappropriate things to him, leading him on on the train. And he's like, I don't remember that, but was she using me? Was she sexually abusing? me. He mentions that a lot of things are just blurry to him. So then they have PETA start to broadcast things. So of course he broadcasts ceasefire. Everyone ceasefire. Put down your weapons. This isn't going to solve anything. He sees Joanna be tortured and what they do is that they strip her of all her clothes and they pound her with a hose of water to the point where she's gasping, can't breathe, and then they electrocute her to get any information from her. Where are the rebels? What are they doing? What is their plan? After she can no longer take it anymore, she says, they're in District 13. They're all in District 13 and she is horrified that she shared that information. You know, I can't blame her. She's being tortured. PETA takes that information. He's like, they're gonna kill them in District 13. He knows what they're capable of. So during the broadcast, when he is ordered to do a ceasefire, he quickly adds in, and you, Katniss, in 13, dead by morning. In Katniss's point of view, she is incredibly grateful for PETA. So happy to see that he's looking healthy for now, but Gail tells her, you know, they're probably torturing him. Oh, if you do this, if you say ceasefire, we'll keep you alive. And that just breaks her heart. But I love seeing initially when she finds out Peta's alive, she runs away and she hides in a closet and she is just almost hysterically happy to the point where she's like laughing in this closet, like puts a hand over her smiling mouth and is like, oh my gosh, he's alive. And she would honestly run away from District 13, but the fact that he's alive keeps her going. And of course, as Peta shares that he, all in 13, dead by morning, a still image of Katniss fills the monitor. For a moment, I can see my eyes reflected behind hers and then a blow to my head. Then he comes back three days later to his cellar. Joanna's like, what happened? What'd they do? He's like, I don't know. I don't remember. And honestly, I don't care. I just want to lay down. He's upset. She's like, Peta, they're using you. They're, you're part of the games. And he's like, I don't care, Joanna. I don't care. Like, stop talking to me. He doesn't care. He's been completely changed. A mutation. He's been altered. And then as he's going to bed, Joanna's like, what is that? and there is some type of gas leaking through, and then they all pass out. And that's when they are saved by District 13. He wakes up, chokes Katniss, and then it's immediately sedated. It happens that quickly. Like he's just like full on mutt mode. Deli is actually a pretty big part of the beginning when he's in District 13 because she was untouched by any of the memories that the Capitol messed with. It's like a form of therapy. As she's talking to him saying, we're in District 13 now, District 12 has been destroyed. He's like, Katniss did it and he starts screaming like, she's a mutt, hide, run, get away from her. Katniss sees through a one-way window of this interaction with Deli. She's like, 
okay, I have to full on let go of Peta because he is never coming back. She's also having feelings for Gail. She knows she can never fully commit because it would just be default. She go for Gail because Peta is no longer himself. And she can never do that to Gail. She can do that to Peta. So she's kind of sworn off. She's like, okay, I'm just not gonna worry about it. I don't even care about anything except killing President Snow. He keeps having nightmares and Hamish is kind of a piece, piece to Peta too. Because Hamish can take the heat. You know, Peta's kind of, kind of a jerk. And Hamish is like, okay, I'll take it. During a serious moment, Pete is like, do the nightmares ever go away? And Hamish says, you're alive to have them. Which I thought was like a pivotal moment because you really get to understand Peta and Hamish and their connection on a deeper level because Peta, Katniss, and Hamish are forever changed. They're always gonna have nightmares and they do. Dr. Melina, Hamish, Prim, and Deli kind of have meetings with Peta to kind of see what he understands, what he believes to be true. They make him watch interviews of himself like, oh, okay, here's you telling everyone ceasefire. And Peta's like, ugh, that weak boy. I'm disgusted by myself. Okay, Peta, who are you? When he asks about his family, he finds out that they are dead and he is grateful for the new version of himself because he really doesn't care. He's like, oh, okay. Like I kind of figured. He's like, I'm kind of grateful I don't care. Which is like so sad and messed up. He somehow feels a little bit of peace with Prim and Prim comes over and she's like, thank you for saving all of District 13 by warning us. And then because she's, you know, studying, Dr. Melina, can we do the same thing? Can we kind of drug him up and try to reverse? reverse the hijacking and Dr. Melina's like, yeah, we for sure can try. So Hamish Prim and Dr. Melina start to talk to Peta. Okay, let's talk about this moment of time. Mm, what do you believe to be real? And things are still thwarted. You know, they're making slow progress. Peta's still not himself. Peta still thinks that Katniss is a mutt, but at the same time, he starts to feel a little bit of sadness for her, but he's not sure why. He can't interpret his feelings at all. Prim actually comes in and she spends a lot of time with Peta and she starts to just knit. And she asks Peta, do you want to watch Katniss's speech? She's going into a district today. So they turn on the TV. This is where Katniss, you know, the rebels are blowing something up. I forget what district it is. So Katniss stands up and is like, okay, don't fight against each other. No one's at fault except President Snow. This is the part where someone from the district like comes up and is like, okay, why can we trust you? Who's to say you're not part of this? And she's like, I don't want to be a piece of their games. And Peta's like, oh, that's familiar because you know, in the first book that he said that to Katniss. And that was also a good moment for Katniss because she's like, I finally understand what Peta meant by that because you know, they kind of got into a weird argument about that in the first book. Then she is of course shot. <laughs> so as Peta is slowly getting better, Hamish is like, okay, Finnick and Annie. Peta's like, okay, don't really like Finnick. Hamish is like, do you want to make a cake? We're trying to make this as happy as can be. So he's like, okay, let me kind of tour you in the kitchen. Peta has a panic attack and he throws bowls of batter and all this ingredients at the wall. He is then sedated and then woken up the next day and is like, okay, let's try that again, but with no one in the room with you. So Peta is left in the kitchen by himself with the ingredients that he can muster up. He makes this beautiful cake. He puts all this decorations on it. He makes colors and he honestly like feels like himself again because he's like, although I don't know myself, I know baking, I know this. Of course he's not invited to the wedding because he's unstable. I love the part when Katniss sees the cake and she knows immediately oh, Peta made this cake. And she's also filled with dread because she's like, I don't want him to be himself again. I can't have any sort of hope in my heart. I just need to kill President Snow. But then Peta asks to see Katniss. So Katniss, after the wedding goes over and she's like, has her arms all crossed and she's like, hey. And Peta kind of analyzes her and is like, okay, you're not very big, are you? And you're not very pretty. <laughs> Seriously, when I read that in Peta's point of view, I was like, okay, let me crossread for sure on this part because I gotta make sure that's actually canon. No, he legit was like, mm, you're not very pretty. And Katniss was like, well, you're not very good looking either right now. He asks, did you ever love me? And she gets all defensive and they kind of argue. And he concludes like, oh, she's just a survivor. She just does anything to survive. She used me in the games. And Katniss kind of knows that she overreacted, but she's also feeling, oh my gosh, the one person who saw the good in me, the one person who made me want to be a good person, has completely changed and he's changed his view on me and that makes me sad. Of course, Hamid, he's mad at Peta and he's mad at Katniss. He basically tells Peta, you are the only thing keeping her mind together and you two were the best thing I ever did and I'm not letting anyone mess that up. Peta's convinced like, okay, I'm just a cocktail of Tracker Jacker Venom and Morphling. I'm just a messed up person. They start to like, you know, let Pete outside more. So they let him outside on the grounds outside of District 13 and he takes a leaf and he smells it and he just like, 
kind of craves life and living again. And that was a really sad part. Pita is kind of a jerk, as we know. Um, he's let out to have lunch, and this is the part when, oh my gosh, I hate this. He's holding his tray with his handcuffs, so it's just like already awkward. He has handcuffs on like the rest of the boat. He comes up and Finnick and Annie are kind of talking. Someone says like, oh, you know Pita made your cake, and Annie's like, oh, thank you so much, Pita. Pita doesn't trust Finnick because he has this thwarted version of Finnick, and he's like, okay, if you don't treat her right, I'm gonna take her away from you, referring to Annie, which is so unlike Peta. I was literally like, and Peta feels no remorse. He's like, yeah, I don't trust the guy. He like gestures to Gail and Katniss and is like, do you know that she's like leading us both on? She told me she loved me. And do you remember the nights on the train? Oh my gosh, savage. And so Gail like takes Katniss out and Peta is like, mm, I should feel bad, but I really don't. So he goes back to his cell and Heyman just like, okay, you're an idiot. I think the main concern right here is just like, Pete doesn't trust anyone. He's like, I don't even trust myself. After this moment, he starts to feel a little bit more empathy. It's really interesting to see his inner dialogue trying to hold on to his virtue and morals. The capital literally stripped him of everything. Of course, this is the part where he starts to shoot like propaganda shots of him like reloading guns, like throwing knives at dummies just to get propaganda. There's a part where Pita there's like a District 13 meeting and he sees Asher, which I'm pretty sure Asher is the girl who's like talking to him the first games after he was reaped. And she was like, oh my gosh, Peta, I love you. And they like kiss. Do you remember that? I think that was Asher. She's in a wheelchair after the attack on 12. He feels empathy because you know, it's Peta and also Asher hasn't been touched by the Capitol. So he's like, how are you doing? How's your family? And he like touches her arm. That's where we see Peta kind of come back. And it's kind of only uphill from here. He starts to hear in his sleep, I do, I need you. And he's like, why would Katniss ever say that to me? But he's not sure if it's blurry or anything. Everyone's like, okay, do we clear you for war? The tracker jacker Venom is almost out of his system, so they clear him to go to war. Oh, is my thing lowering slowly? Not my camera lowering. They really question, like, do you really want to do this? And Peta says, I need to find myself, and I know she's the only person that can help me find myself. My camera is free. <laughs> Are you seeing this? My tripod. Are we good? This is a really interesting part. Before Peta goes into the Capitol, visits Joanna, cause Joanna wants to go. And he's like, Joanna, don't. Like you're not doing well. And she's like, don't tell me what to do. I wish the old Peta was back, the one that didn't care. So we see that Joanna's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah. He goes on the hovercraft, says goodbye to Hamage. Peta's kind of more of his charismatic self. And he realizes, I wanna come back here. I wanna survive. I don't wanna die anymore. As they kind of set up a tent as they're getting ready to storm the capital, Pita's like setting up his tent by himself and no one's really talking to him. A couple people are like, maybe you should eat, come and eat with us. So that was sweet. Katniss comes out at one part and is like, look at him, he's just a mutt created by the capital. Pita heard that and it breaks my heart. I'm like, Katniss, what the F? He just goes back to like unpacking a sleeping bag. He can't sleep and he's really calm. This is where you kind of just see that he's a peacemaker. Like he didn't wanna, he didn't wanna hurt Katniss or anything after what she said. As he can't sleep, we don't deserve Finnick at all. Finnick comes over and is like, here, here's a rope. I'll teach you a few knots that you can do as you can't sleep. So he shows Peta how to tie some knots. It's so cute, which is also cute because he's in handcuffs. So they kind of have this conversation, like Peta hands the rope to Holmes and he's like, you try. And Finnick talks about his district. He talks about the water and Peta's like, Katniss wants to live near the water. I don't know, I love that part, that detail because He's remembering things. This is like one of my favorite parts in the movie. Peta and Katniss talk during the night watch and he's trying to say anything, but he can't think of anything just because he's so unsure, like discovering himself and discovering how he feels. And he tries to think of one thing the capital didn't touch. And he's like, colors, orange and green. So he asks, is your favorite color green? And she's like, yes. And yours is orange. You sleep with the windows open. You do all this stuff and you double knot your shoelaces. And then she runs away. And then Peta looks down and he double knots his shoelaces, <laughs> which is the cutest part. That's the point. Like he wanted to be with Katniss because she knew him better than anyone else. And they play real or not real. Everyone around the table kind of with the whole squad. And it's kind of, you know, really sad because Peta's also like, and they killed Avoxes in the training center in front of me. Real or not real. And he kind of gets mad and they're like, real, as far as I know. I think Boggs says that. I think that's when people are like, okay, we can't hold anything against Peta because he literally was tortured beyond what we can even fathom. I love seeing Finnick handle Peta because he is married to Annie, he understands Annie and he helped Annie through everything. We can see a lot of that reflection in Peta. Finnick is so good at just guiding him, being like, it's all right, buddy, let me help you. Like when Peta and Katniss play real or not real, they're 
like Katniss's point of view kind of mentions, like we talk about grade school, we talk about cheese buns. And in PETA's point of view, we see their conversations, like the names of teachers they had, the whole conversations of why they talk about cheese buns, how they were snowed in and had that conversation and catching fire. All of a sudden there's a bomb, they're in full on war, boom, boom, boom. It skips a lot because PETA goes into mutt mode, he's passed out for a lot of it because, you know, they sedate him or knock him out, I forget which one. So this is after the black tar waves, Boggs dies, PETA tries to kill Katniss, in turn killing someone on their squad, then he's, you know, passed out. He wakes up to the hologram of the Capitol and then they like search that Capitol room for food and he gives Katniss her favorite can of soup. They go underground and PETA is so good with words. I love, I love him so much. You know, Pollux is freaking out because he worked five years underground and never saw daylight. That was a really sad thing for everyone to hear and Katniss explains it. Oh, it kind of got awkward, but then PETA's like, well, looks like you just became her best asset. Such an encouraging thing to say, so sweet. So they're doing like rotations, he's trying to get some sleep and as he's trying to sleep, Katniss reaches out and touches his hair and he's filled with terror and excitement. He doesn't know how to react. And so he turns and kind of just looks at her. He suddenly wants to be close to her because he feels comfort now. He can sense that she wants him to come back too. She tells him, we take care of each other, Peta, which is sweet. As he finally falls asleep, he has a stream of them in the flaming chariots holding hands. And you know, the crowds are like, Katniss, Katniss. And then he's repeating it and then he wakes up and he's like, why am I saying her name over and over again? He realizes there's mutts. There's mutts. The, the capital. They're in my head. Mutts are coming for you, Katniss. Let's run. So this is where they run and this is crazy. Um, we lose Finnick. I hate that part so much. As Finnick dies, Peta has a flashback to the mutation monkeys to where like Finnick helped. I keep saying Josh Hutcherson. Why am I saying Josh Hutcherson? Where Finnick helps Peta allies. We're gonna be buds. I'm glad we had that moment because we get to see that Peter will remember Finnick as a good guy. He cannot focus after that and that's where he's like pushing against his handcuffs to make himself bleed, to keep himself grounded. And that's where Katniss is like, you're okay, let's go. I need you, please stay with me. And that's where he repeats like, always. I love that part. Boom, 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 bunch of destruction. Peter's like, honestly kind of there. I'm surprised he even survived because Pete is in handcuffs the entire time. They arrive at the apartment where Katniss just shoots the bystander. <laughs> I feel bad, but whatever. He puts his face in a pillow and he just wants to cry for all the deaths. Peta can't handle it. You know, they disguise himself, put on makeup. As Katniss is putting on makeup, he feels, he feels comforted and he feels comforted by the smell of her. And also he remembers when they put on that kind of serum after the fog in the in the second games. And then when he paints her face, he's like, have I painted your face before, real or not real? She says real, sunflowers during training. You know, Katniss has this whole confession to the group and she's like, look, everyone's dead because of me. And honestly, this was just a selfish mission because I wanted to kill Snow. Everyone's like, well, we knew that. But Gail was like, it's okay, Katniss. Like it's successful. We lost people, but look, we're in the capital. And Peta is like, okay, but I understand why she's sad. Like people are dying. People who are close to us have died. So right there, like Peta sees like, Gail and I are very different. I want to approach this empathetically. And he just is like, we're successful, we're gonna win. He has this inner dialogue of like, okay, the most important thing here is unity. We have to stay together because that's why we ate the berries. We didn't eat the berries for rebellion. We didn't eat it for survival. We ate the berries in the first games because Katniss couldn't go on without me and I couldn't go on without her. We need, need to stay together. Pollux teaches him a little bit of sign language, language like water and stuff and it's really cute. Peta is thinking about how he's getting to know Katniss a lot more, especially since he's not obsessed with her, how he's getting to know her in a new light. Oh, this is important. So <laughs> Gail and Peta wake up at the same time as they're sleeping below like the Capital lingerie store with Tigris. And Gail's like, you want some water? So Gail gets Peta some water, but because Peta's handcuffed to the staircase, Gail has to feed it to him, which Peta's incredibly embarrassed by. And so they kind of have this conversation. Peta feels confused because Gail is like, like Katniss loves you, Peta, because you love her. And he's like, mm, but do I? I don't even know. Before they go, you know, they start to go undercover, just go into the capital. Katniss goes first. She hugs Peta. Gail's watching, which Peta is aware of. There's like a true emotional connection when they hug, which is really cute. I loved seeing this in Peta's point of view because he is just following all the destruction. You, you know, Katniss sees like the slap, like the floor completely collapse. People like burning up and turning pink. All the pods are activating. So Peta follows seeing all the destruction after. So he hears the screams from the hole in the ground and the mutations down there. He's wearing a scarf over his face 
and he actually takes off his scarf and puts it around this little boy who is bleeding out. He gets the boy to safety in like an old grocery store. Because the destruction is so bad, he's like, okay, nobody cares about me. I'm just gonna full on run. I'm gonna run, try to find Katniss. I need to find Katniss because we're all gonna die. The explosions go off, but he's far enough away to where he's knocked down and he has a headache and he's burned and bleeding, but not as bad as Katniss. So he goes to Katniss and I never thought about it. I have never thought that it was PETA who saved Katniss. So PETA basically like, like puts himself over her to like put out the fire and then she's passed out and he carries her, which is showing his strength. But also he's been so weak because he's been a mutt that he carries her to the one place he can think of, which is the Tribute Training Center. He takes her there, puts her in a closet, the closet to where he went after his hands were cut in the first book when Katniss shoved him against a vase. <laughs> he holds her there. He finds like some band-aids and stuff. He bandages her as best as he can, but he's on the verge of passing out. Then he just cradles her and they both pass out and he hopes that Haymitch finds them. Haymitch does find them. Peter's kind of losing hope. He says, this is not a happy story. Love and sanity are in pieces. After Haymitch finds them, like Peta wakes up. That's when he discovers that Portia has been killed. He has become fully himself again, sort of, but his empathetic self is kind of back. And this is where we see that he's mourning Portia so badly because he's so sad because his family's dead, Finnick's dead, all these people are dead. And I think with Portia, that's the first death to where he was kind of coming back to himself. You know, Hamish gives him a book from her apartment and he sees all his costumes that she had written out and he loves her art. They also went back to her house and for some reason, Portia had a sketchbook of Pita's and Pita had sketched Katniss out. And Pita's like, I see in the sketch that I truly loved this girl. Katniss has moved to the mansion. Pita, you should go to the mansion. He's like, oh, I, I can't. I am only gonna go if Katniss asks for me. Hamish is upset because he's like, you guys need each other, idiots. As they, you know, meet in the quarter and they're talking about having a second Hunger Games, Peta is like, okay, out of the 59 living victors, Quarter Quail lost 18 and then Finnick, that's 40 count. 33 of them actually died in the war. So they were killed for maybe being suspected capitalists, suspected rebels. Peta's like, that's very interesting because if you were reaped in the Quarter Quell, like us, you actually had a higher chance of survival. Peta is appalled that they want to start another Hunger Games. He just wants them to create peace, to just end this war, not start any more deaths. Finally looks at Katniss and she looks at him with dark eyes and she votes yes, another Hunger Games. And he's mad, so he storms off. He absolutely goes into autopilot when she shoots coin. Doesn't even remember his feet moving, his arms, but he grabs her, keeps her from the nightlock. And she's like, let go of me, Peta. And he says, I can't. And he knows that he really can't. I love this because I saw someone do a video on where Peter has been selfless this entire time, but that was the one thing he's like, I can't let her die because of me. I want her here. So they have a whole trial. Are we gonna kill Katniss? Are we gonna have punishment for Katniss for killing President Coyne? He vouches for her, you know, on film. And he's like, okay, I've loved her for so long. And that love for her, she felt for Prim. So she acted out, out of just love. She was angry and she's not stable like any of us. He just wants this to end. He doesn't want to be a spokesperson anymore. He doesn't want to try to avoid or end something. He just wants to have freedom and have Katniss be okay. It's sad because they have a monitor in Katniss and he can see that she's trying to get off Morphling. She's trying to starve herself and she's just really sad. So PETA lives in the capital after. So the capital really isn't safe. People are still in danger. There's no order even with Snow dead. Hamish hey, visits him. PETA asks, are we having another Hunger Games? Haymitch is like, no, that died with coin. And Plutarch said that she never discussed it with him. And Haymitch gives him a cake because he's like, it's, you'll be 18 in two weeks and I won't be here. And he's like, why wouldn't you be here? Also, it's so sweet he gave him cake because Haymitch is going back to District 12 with Katniss. And Haymitch is like, you'll be 18 soon. You can ride away your freedom if you just want to come. Peter's like, no, I have to get better. So I'll stay here until I get better and I'll come. I'll come to you guys when I'm better. Um, this is really interesting, very interesting. So Peter's like exercising in the training center because he's trying to get his strength back. And he sees on the TV, this girl speaking who looks like Katniss, but he's like, I feel like I recognize her. And then he's like, ding, ding, ding. Runs to Dr. Molina is like, Dr. Molina. Like who is, why do I recognize this girl? Basically they had used an actor that looked like Katniss to like sexually abuse him when he was hijacked. Literally, they also put on a play of the 74th Hunger Games with Peta and Katniss actors, and they hired her on to torture Peta. Isn't that freaking messed up? So Dr. Malina is like, okay, we can take this into consideration during our meetings. Um, so when finally he's well enough to go home, he decides to go back to District 12, of course. 
And he goes into the woods to help himself, but also do something for Katniss because he wants to help her. They're all in the Victor village because surprisingly it hasn't been touched by the bombs. So he starts digging by her house. Oh my gosh, I forgot to mention. Oh my gosh. Wait, Gail comes to PETA at the training center and is like, hey, I'm going to district two. And PETA's like, why? And he's like, mm, I have a job there. They're gonna like hire me on somewhere. Also, I just, as, a, as Katniss's friend, I just wanna thank you for all that you did for her. So PETA's like, oh, so they're friends. I wonder why. So PETA says that it's like very awkward and painful, that conversation, but it was needed. And it was a very interesting conversation. So PETA's planting primroses around Katniss's, like on the side of her house. And this is my, oh my gosh, this quote is so funny. He says, I hear the door slam and feet come running around the side of her house. And it's only then that I realize my enthusiasm for my chore has probably overreached politeness. Because he's just probably like banging, trying to like dig at this. Katniss looks terrible, he says. She looks unshowered, has like greasy hair and like dirt underneath her nails because she's probably doing so unwell. And he's basically like, hey, Dr. Melina wants you to call him. And she's like, okay. And then she runs away because you know, it's so painful. But they talk about, oh, I decided that I should plant primrose for prim. That's such a good part. He goes over and he brings her bread after like a couple weeks, give her some space. She looks better. She showered and put together, cutting the bread for her. And they, they don't really talk about anything, but he's just there as Greasy says, like doing dishes. And he's like, because I know that our story always starts with bread. Are you kidding? That's the sweetest thing. He goes home and he watches the quarter quill. He skips over the deaths, but he sees him kissing her and he's like, okay, how do I interpret this? Did I, did I kiss her just for like the stay, like for the show, did I kiss her because I loved her? He couldn't tell, but now he knows what's actually real. Then we just like jump forward and he wakes up from a bad dream and he's like clutching dirt because he's outside and then he wakes up and she's right there. Katniss and him, I guess, have been laying outside just enjoying the weather. He doesn't really go violent when he goes mutt mode or when he has flashbacks, he kind of just spaces out and just like, Katniss is like, maybe we should go to the lake tomorrow. So they meet up and they go to the lake. This is a very interesting part. They stop at this rock. Katniss seems weird and Peta's like, what's wrong? And she's like, oh, this is just a spot that Gail and I used to, you know, meet up. And he's like, okay. Peta's like, mm, I actually don't want to know anything. Katniss is like, well, we have to be honest with one another. Gail had all this fire and he had all this fight, envy and war in him. And I have enough of that myself. I need something to help create peace. Something to make me feel soft. Peter's like, oh. <laughs> you know, they have this huge dialogue about being honest with each other. He feels like close to her, but he's not like in love yet because he doesn't have his memories. Anyways, this is a weird part. I thought it was weird. Maybe you guys liked it. They go to the lake. She freaking strips naked. <laughs> Legit, she's naked. I'm like, okay, whatever. You do you, girl. Peter's like, whoa, Katniss. She's like, I don't care. I don't care, you can see my naked. And he's like, no, but I do because I want these boundaries because I know what we've both been through. I'm creating these boundaries for our relation, the good of our relationship. And she's like, don't worry about me. Like, I like being close with you. There's nothing to hide. And he just notices that she has all these scars from like being burned. And so they start to swim together. <laughs> then at one point she like swims over to him and like kisses him. He feels something. Oh, this is so comforting. This is so wonderful. And there's more conversation. He understands that no other person on earth will understand what they're going through except each other. Flash forward, he has two kids. They're so cute. He's like a little baby and then he has a little girl and the little girl's like extremely smart and he ex is explaining how lucky he is to have her because with parents as broken as they are, she is like a blessing in their life. So she wakes up, Peta goes in and finds that she is taking care of her little brother in the middle of the night in the crib. And he's like, honey, you gotta go to bed. And she's like, I can't sleep. So they go on the porch and they kind of talk. His daughter asks about the Hunger Games because she's learning about it in school. And Peta's like, okay, we'll have to tell you sometime, but it's getting late. So he goes to Katniss and he's like, our daughter wants to know about the Hunger Games. And Katniss is like, well, I guess we will have to teach her and it's good for them to learn because it is our history and it brought us to where we are now. She'll always know that we'll have a part in it and she'll know why mom and dad just aren't the same. Flash forward, Peta wakes up from a bad nightmare. Katniss is always there. He says like, every time I have a nightmare, Katniss just hugs me, holds me. I ask her, you love me, real or not real? And she says real. That's like the end. 
you guys I gotta go to work I really do it was like so perfect the only thing I would have changed is I wish like Katniss maybe didn't strip naked because that was just a little jarring for her character to just be like she's always been so private in gym class like in the hunger rooms everything and then all of a sudden like hmm I just felt like oh that wasn't very Katniss like but I loved getting to know their family I I think I maybe will read back to 12 because that's like her fourth fan fiction set after the Hunger Games, after Mockingjay. It was just amazing to get to know Peeta, to get to know Katniss. I'm really happy I read this fan fiction. I definitely think this is the beginning of an era for me. Maybe fan fiction will be like my new jam. It really is my new jam, but this is like the only fan fiction series I've ever read. I really hope you guys got something out of this. I think this book was for me the one I could dissect the most just because they have so many different stories and they were healing and also like Peeta's character development seeing him change with his inner dialogue literally going against everything that was freaking awesome i hope this this video finds the right people i know how it feels to not feel understood when you're reading a book to feel like you have so much to say and then you can't discuss it with anyone that's really why i made this youtube channel is because i wanted to share my book thoughts i wanted to feel like i was talking to someone and then when i uploaded my first video like that excitement and that need to share it was satisfied and i was like oh my gosh so that's how this youtube channel was born also like in high school, I uploaded vlogs, but we don't need to know that. Okay, so for the record, I recorded a whole A video yesterday that was 45 minutes long, and then I had to run to work. And then when I got to work, I was like, mm, I talked to Hunter. I was like, I don't think I had my notes organized enough. I feel like I was all over the place. So I like reformatted my notes and we're re recording a whole video. So I'm excited to get this over with. I was editing a previous video and I realized I was holding the book the entire time. Also, I love that I always have my night mode on. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. May the odds be ever in your favor.